Ladies and gentlemen, welcome again. My name is Valerie, and thank you so much for being a part of You Alive today. The program today is in three sections. Firstly, a 10-minute talk by our speaker, Mr. Min Liang Tan, and then a 20-minute interview session with Mr. Viswa Sadasivan, the chairman of the You Alive organizing committee, and then finally, a 30-minute Q&A session. If you wish to ask a question, please make your way to the microphones placed along the aisles, introduce yourself, and speak directly into them. This is essential so our online community is able to hear your question. Um, today, we'll also be using Pigeonhole Live for our Q&A session. So if you have a smartphone, a tablet, or a laptop computer with you, you can just launch your internet browser and go to phlive.at. Just key in our event passcode, which is UALIVE, which is U-A-L-I-V-E, and click Go. You're then free to fire away all your burning questions while also voting for any question that interests you. The more popular questions with more votes will stand a higher chance to be answered by our speaker. Also, do remember to leave some feedback on the Pigeonhole application after the event. Thank you so much for your kind attention and please sit back and enjoy. Gentlemen, a round of applause for Mr. Min Liang Tan. Thank you for having me. Thank you, NUS, for uh, inviting me over here. So, um, well, it's good to see that at least there are a couple of people here. I was concerned that uh, nobody would turn up. So, <laughs> that's great. Uh, I received the invitation to come speak with uh, you guys about uh, two months ago. Um, and true to NUS uh, tradition, I did absolutely nothing until about last night. Then I started panicking and preparing and, and stuff like that, which is fine. So if, um, I'm glad that you guys didn't have to pay for this because you would not get your money back after this uh, chat. Now, nonetheless, uh, uh, just a quick introduction uh, about myself in case uh, you guys may not be necessarily familiar with Razor. Um, we don't deal with shaving equipment. So yeah. <laughs> for those of you who thought that, you know, it's like somebody from Gillette or something like that, it's a nice time for you to just skedaddle out. But we are Razer. We make uh, probably some of the best uh, gaming hardware in the world. Uh, for example, we make, yeah, Razer. So we make uh, probably some of the best gaming mice, keyboards, um, headphones on the planet. Uh, we, didn't just we don't just design and, and manufacture uh, mice, keyboards, etc. But pretty much if you look at any gaming peripheral, uh, peripheral out there, we invented this entire industry. So that's been great fun for us uh, the past couple of uh, years. Um, on top of that, we design and, and build gaming laptops. Uh, we've recently launched them over here in Singapore, the Razer Blade. Uh, we make some of the world's thinnest uh, gaming laptops uh, out there, um, primarily in North America. But uh, right now, we've started launching in other parts of the world. So that's good. We've also got a software platform that gamers come and log on every single day, right? We've got millions of them that come on board. We do everything in terms of uh, communications, VoIP, etc., uh, to boosting games and uh, pretty much everything. So, in a nutshell, we design things for gamers, by gamers, and that's pretty much our motto. Um, so a little bit about myself. When we first founded Razer, it was just uh, myself and uh, my co-founder, Robert Krakoff, two of us, um, not knowing anything better about business, which was, I think, fortunate for us. Uh, two of us back then, a couple of years back, we've grown to about uh, close to 500 employees worldwide uh, in 10 cities. We are headquartered out of uh, California, um, where I spend most of my time, but I come back to Singapore pretty much every month uh, because the food is good, and we've got a good presence over here. So, in true NUS student fashion, I think I've 
gone through at least two or three minutes, so I'm left with seven, so that's good. <laughs> um, in a nutshell, I think today, you know, when I looked at uh, inspiration uh, and things like that, I don't think I'm in the best position to inspire. What I can do, however, is to share a little bit about or some lessons I've learned in the past couple of years um, having founded Razor. Uh, first of which, uh, and probably pre pretty much three lessons, you know, uh, that I've learned in the past couple of years from a two-man shop to a couple of hundred people right now. The first lesson is it's actually fine to waste time, all right? So I've gone through pretty much most of my life having people tell me that I'm wasting my time. And every time I've been told that I'm wasting my time playing computer games, uh, chasing girls, etc., these have actually become my most valuable assets, or most productive, well, the gaming part, has have become <laughs> my, well, the other parts too, right? Okay. Um, most valuable assets today. All the time that I was told, you know, gaming is horrible, or it's, um, you're never gonna amount to much from computer gaming. Uh, I didn't really care, like probably most of you guys. And I spent most of my time playing everything from Ultima to Wasteland uh, to, you know, World of Warcraft, etc., which I'm sure a lot of you guys play too. So, basically, we, I've, t I've taken pretty much everything I was, uh, I took pretty much everything I was passionate about and converted it. Now, not to say that I didn't enjoy what I was learning at NUS and things like that, but that was my passion. That is my passion. Until today, it's still a passion for us. Razor isn't a business for us. It's not a business, it never has been and probably never will be because we do all kinds of crazy stuff at, at Razor. But really, at every point of time that I was told I was wasting my time, I was actually learning something, I was actually doing something truly constructive for the future. So, the good news is, if you guys feel that you're wasting your time, even in this talk, it could help you in the future, all right? So that's, that's the first thing I, pretty, I, I learned uh, pretty much in the past couple of years, that it's fine to waste time. Now, the second thing uh, that has translated, I like your shoes green, razor green, awesome, right? And the second thing I've pretty much learned um, along the way is that, it's actually pretty good not to work very hard, right? It's, it's great. I'm one of the laziest bastards you'll see in any place. Um, and yeah, I'm, it's counterintuitive to the government telling you, oh, please work hard and, and things like that. Now, I, I pretty much in NUS and, and pretty much every point of time of my life, everything I wasn't very passionate about, I, was, I wasn't very interested in, I kind of did the bare minimum to close through. Oh, don't look at me like that. Most of you do the same thing, all right? <laughs> so, I, I coasted through pretty much everything. I didn't really work very hard at. And I think at any point of time that you feel that you're working really hard and you're you know, killing yourself getting something done, it's either you don't really like what you're doing or you're not very good at it anyway, all right? So every single day I spend hours, days, months, years, for example, trying to, trying to design, get the most perfect color or, or get the the perfect angle, or get the perfect precision out of all our products. That's not, that's not work for me. I spend hours, days, etc., doing that, but that's real fun for us. And in terms of that, we've got some really great people at Razor who really like to do the other stuff that I'm not passionate about, for example. You know, we, I've got one of the best CFOs out there, a really smart guy, I've got one of the best COOs who are really passionate about things that I'm not passionate about, manufacturing, and I mean, some of you guys may be passionate about it, but they like that, and to them, it's not work. So don't work so hard. Do something that, that you're really passionate about. It could be something you're studying right now. It could be something that you take from what you're studying and, and bring it to something else. And tomorrow, for example, if I had to start all over again, I'll be absolutely happy to start all over again, doing something fun just as every single day is fun for us at Razor. We do all kinds of crazy stuff. So, that's the second thing I, I, I really learned, that it's good not to work really hard. And the third thing pretty much, and I think this is, this is uh, probably coming from a, a very Singapore uh, background, is it's okay to get an F. It's, 
absolutely fine to get an F. You know, look at, look at all my, my lessons right now, you know. It's fine to waste time, uh, don't work so hard, it's okay to get an F. This is a diabolical plan to make all of you guys drop out so I can hire you guys cheap. No, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not that. But I think one of the things, I, I think every single day, you know, we are, we're so caught up with, with, uh, with results. You know, we're so caught up with metrics that are artificial, right? The same things that, that we are conditioned or told every single day that it's, it's vitally important, you have to pass it. If you don't, don't pass it, your, your life is destroyed, it's ruined, etc. In the greater scheme of things, candidly, nobody cares, right? In the long term, at the end of, oh, I've got one minute, oh dear, I thought I was going to, to, to you know, be done within five. But it's okay to get an F. It's absolutely fine. Why? Because in the greater scheme of things, when it comes to something you really care about, when you get an F in something that, you know, three years ago or ten years ago, it's not going to be reflected in the work that you do or that you really want to do and you really want to do well. So that's pretty much the third lesson I've really learned, you know, out there. That is absolutely fine to get an F. You learn something from it. Sometimes it's funny. I got food when I was in in college, first year, F-O-O-D. You know, that was a nice acronym to have. But that's one of those things which, you know, I feel it was something important, that failure is great in many ways. So that's the 10-minute mark, which is great. So I've completed my task over here. Fantastic. Anyhow, if you guys have any questions and stuff like that, feel free to, to, to drop me a note on my Facebook page search for me on Twitter, don't write anything rude, I will block you and hunt you down, um, or, or anything. Otherwise, Viswa, thank you very much. You're amazing, man. Oh. Uh, isn't he amazing? <laughs> come on, come thank on, come much. on. <laughs> Gosh, I feel old. You know, it's been 11 years since I've been here in the in, in no, US. I, I, I feel I, I've been doing this for three years, by the way. This is the third year of your life. And I say this hand in heart, you are the most amazing guest I've had. Oh, is that right? Thank really, you very much. You're the most amazing <laughs> guest I've had. You know, hello. <laughs> it's OK not to clap. It's fine. OK. <laughs> and he didn't pay me, unlike the other guests, you know. Um, by the way, I feel overdressed. I wanted to remove my jacket, but I was told that it contrasts, the white shirt contrasts too much with my skin tone. <laughs> what, 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 what do they mean by that? I don't know. Okay. So, what's with you lawyers, huh? Oh, yes, law. You, there must be something wrong with the legal profession because all of you end up not practicing, all the good ones. You end up being entrepreneurs, starting, being really successful, doing really good work, and then the rest of them end up being judges and so on. And making a lot of money huh? too. Yeah, and making really a lot of money. How right. many of you are from law here? Oh, nobody from law? No, no, no. There, oh, there must good be. for you. This is the brave soul. There must be quite a few, but they don't want to put their hands up. Oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> right. He uh, graduated from law school in 2002, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyways, of course. And, uh, and this is where he's ended up. Now, one of the things I... I, I, I was told was in April this year, there was an interesting incident, right? You want to share with us what happened? April. Uh, you know the, the, the discount thing? Oh, The okay. discount coupon? Right, right, right. You want to share with us what happened? Sure, sure. How many of you know about that? How many of oh, you wow. bought it online? No, it was only open in the UK, so oh, it was, only it was fine. Okay, okay. Right. Share with us what happened. Uh, sure. Well, you know, we took over an online site, uh, online shop. We had a third-party contractor build our online shop. Um, they left a discount coupon which was uh, cryptically entitled 1234. So anybody who keyed in 1234 as a discount code for our UK store would instantly get 90% off uh, our products. 90% off, huh? Okay. Right. And? So, uh, well, being the internet, you know, some guy found out uh, he could have just profited from it from a long term because it wouldn't have come out on the radar. Decided to post it on Facebook, uh, tweeted about it, it went viral and a whole bunch of people you know, bought products um, uh, on a store with 90% off uh, before we found out. 
And it took us, I mean, it took us about an hour before it, it got flagged up and uh, we shut the And how many out. people had bought it? Uh, quite a number, en enough to create a dent, right? And what, thousands? Uh, I, th the, the re I mean, the amount was in the millions, right? The amount was in the yes. millions. Millions of dollars, yes. by the way. Okay. Well, if it was units, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. So we ran out. So um, we, we sat back and we said, look, you know, um, what do we want to do, right? We, on one hand, we were totally within our rights to say, look, we're sorry, it was a mistake, and things like that. Uh, on another hand, we said, look, is this something we can afford right now at least? Um, it was a genuine mistake. It was one of our partners. We want to take responsibility for it. Uh, we asked the guys that were clearly trying to profit from this, mm. buying 20 or 50 of it and, and trying to resell it, for example. And we said, look, you, know, you can have one, uh, but we honored it. It was one of those things where we, as a team, sat together and said, what would we do as gamers? And uh, we said, we'll just do that. And uh, it was cool. I mean, we didn't expect uh, to have a lot of press and things like that, but there was a lot of press, which was yeah. Yeah. Uh, cool in a not so good way because we made a mistake. But uh, yeah, it, was, it, it worked out fine. It but it turned out, out well. It turned right? out well. People well. appreciated it. Now, for me, when I read it, it, it was extremely refreshing. Um, I, I can't think of a single company that I know that would have done the same thing. Uh, I, I think this has a lot to do with the faith you have in people. Oh, what was great actually after that was that we had a whole bunch of gamers who came back to us and said, look, you know, I'm sorry I profited off yep. your mistake and they cancelled their orders. And that was... Isn't that amazing? That was They cancelled the orders. The amazing. question is, do you think the same thing would have happened in Singapore? Sure. <laughs> oh. Hello. Have a bit more faith, huh? No, I'm, I mean, we've got lots of gamers uh, who are really passionate about what they do here in Singapore. Um, and I absolutely am pretty sure it would, have, it would be the same thing in Singapore. But what, what you did was you held the faith that people, people in the end will not abuse it and you honour it mm -hmm. and you move on, right? And, and then later on, you also came up with, I mean, you, you did some things and you gave people the option of donating it to charity. Yes. Right? Yes. You want to share with us that? that? Uh, yeah. So we developed uh, some software recently, uh, Razor Surround. If, if you guys haven't tried it out, uh, we've been working on it for a couple of years. And um, originally, we wanted to launch, it's a, it's a piece of software that uh, resides in the PC that will allow you to have surround sound instead of just you know, uh, stereo sound. It, it simulates virtual surround. So in all your games, it becomes a lot more lifelike, right? So we were planning to launch it at about 1999, uh, some time ago, but uh, there, was a, there was a charity that, that uh, a lot of the gamers in the company, they were really passionate about it, um, Child's Play. So mm -hmm. what we decided mm -hmm. to do was to say, hey guys, until the end of the year, we're gonna give this away for free. If you download it now or sign up now, it's gonna be absolutely free for you for life. Um, but in return, we would like you to, and put them on, everybody on a guilt trip, right? Every time they try to download it, they say, donate to Child's Play and, and things like that. Like, they are getting something for 20 bucks for free. So please try to donate, donate up to 20 bucks mm -hmm. for that. And we have raised uh, tens of thousands of dollars for Child's Play. Just like that. And, and, and it's great. It's really about believing that people will do this, right? And, um, and, and that's, that, that's what stood out for me when I, when I saw it. The other thing about what you said just now, you know, you said you don't have to be, you don't have to be efficient all the time. I mean, not in so many words, but sure. you said that. And um, here, here's the thing. My own sense is sometimes when you're preoccupied with efficiency, you actually end up losing resilience. Okay. Let, let, let me explain. You know, for example, in Singapore, it's, it's my pet theory that the reason why we don't have resilience, we're not sufficiently resilient is because we're not allowed to make mistakes. And the reason why we're not allowed to make mistakes, we've not had the opportunity to make big mistakes when you're growing up, is because you're told to be safe. You know, so when you take the safe path, what are the chances of you tripping big? Slim, right? The classic thing is you, when you go to a playground, and, and, and this, is, this is very interesting, my, my own playground near my house, you see this kid walking, four-year-old, you know, walking, you know, walking like that, like that, you know. Psychomotor skills are really bad. That's why we have all these problems in NS. You know, so they walk. It's because of you guys. You know, you just exercise your fingers. So they walk, and with, with the maid, you know, the helper in tow. Sure. And this guy invariably falls. 
Then you see this, this Botak boy coming from China. He's standing there, right? Resilient, tough. He goes there, he climbs, he falls, he dusts himself, he moves on. And, and that struck me, you know. Here, this kid is not allowed to fall because you've got the helper on tow, right? Before he falls, you're grabbed. But this is the problem. It's, it's, a, it's a powerful metaphor of what we are, you know. And it's all about efficiency. Well, getting it right the first time. Sure. Don't fall. If you fall, you're weak. Now, what, what, what's your view on that? I mean, for us. Well, I suppose I see pros and cons um, in, ev in everything. I, I was trained as a lawyer anyway, yeah. right? So, you know, I, I tend to see pros and cons in, in, in all situations, but... He's suddenly concerned because he knows this is webcast. <laughs> okay. No, it's, it's, it's more like, um, I think, at the end of the day, failure is fine. You know, fear of failure is also perfectly fine. I mean, it, yeah. it, it breeds different kinds of people and in, in different roles. And, and the one thing I think we've, we've really learned is, I think over the years, is that there's always a role for, for every kind of person, right? Um, resilience is absolutely important. You know, if you're starting a company and you're going to go out there and you're going to take the hard knocks and, and, and things like that. But there's some paths which are phenomenal for people who say, look, I just want to focus on a pure technical path. I want to, to, to invent something. I don't necessarily want to start something. And, and that has worked out really well, I think, for a different kind of, of individual. So I think it's getting the right kind of position and the right kind of role for the right kind of person. That's something that um, at least we try to do at, at Razor. All of a sudden, you're sounding very government. Oh, is that right? You know? <laughs> um, no, I thought government's trying to get everyone to be an entrepreneur. Yeah, they spoke I think to you on, on, on the other hand, I, I don't necessarily see it that way. I, I, I mean, I would be absolutely fine working in a large organization or working for somebody in a large organization as long as I feel that I'm actually creating some kind of value. Value, yeah. okay. And I'm creating something, I'm contributing something at the end of the day because it's, it's not about being able to manage large teams. Or it's, and, and I think that's, that's one of the things that we've been, we've been told is, is a measure of success, managing people or managing, managing large teams. But I've met some of the most talented engineers or most talented lawyers and, and things like that, and they work absolutely well in a silo. They just don't play well with others. Yeah. But they're insanely intelligent and they're insanely great in, in what they do. And if, we were, if anyone was to try to pull the guy and say, look, you have to manage a team, and, and that's usually the recipe for, for huge failure. Um, in, instead, so I think it took even you know, ourselves a, a bit of time to say, great, we've got a technical path for guys who want to be great in what they do. They don't necessarily want to be a CEO or, or COO or whatever it is, mm -hmm. see whatever or chief entertainment officer, which is great. Mm. Uh, <laughs> uh, we've got that position in the company. Uh, the, it's, it's really finding the, the right um, path forward. So I don't necessarily think entrepreneurship is, is, is good for all. For all, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, quick question before we throw it open to the floor. Now, you started the company in Singapore then you established a base in San Francisco. Am well, I it was a bit the other way around. We okay. kind of opened two offices simultaneously. Two offices simultaneously. Yeah. Now, my question to you is, do you think, and your, your net worth right now would be about 200 million? I don't talk about stuff like that. Okay, <laughs> let's say it's about 200 million. Modest estimate. If it's that amount of money, and it's a very fast growth over how many years? A mm, couple of years, eight years, eight nine years. years yeah. nine? Okay. Quite phenomenal, right? Do you think you would have been able to make this growth, achieve this, this, this level of growth, if you were based in Singapore, just in Singapore? Uh, and you know, you can be in Singapore and have a global market. Sure, sure, sure. For the business you do. Uh, well, I suppose growth has never been, you know, one of the topmost considerations at Razor. So I suppose it's, it's tough for me. So I mean, I don't calculate all the time how much money or, or, or revenues. So we're a little bit of a different company of sorts in the sense that for us, it's always the product. And we are insanely obsessed with, with designing product. And it doesn't matter. And, and, and to design great product for us, it's really finding the right people in the right places to, to do that. So we started in, in, uh, in California 
primarily because there were a group of people that were really passionate about engineering mm -hmm. or, or, mm -hmm. or, or designing stuff. And then when we came back and set up our office over here in Singapore, it took us a while, but we started finding people who, who could do the same thing. Now, um, and candidly speaking, I think for those guys that, that know Razor, we tend to do the craziest kind of products. They don't necessarily translate to, to uh, uh, any, f it, it doesn't make any financial sense whatsoever, for example, like left-handed gaming mice. Why? Because, you know, every single unit we sell, we lose money at. Uh, it would give a traditional financial guy a heart attack because, firstly, most left-handers use their right hand anyway to, use, to play yeah. computer games. Um, it, but it's one of those things that we're passionate about. So growth in terms of a, a, geogra a geography or, or, or jurisdiction has never been something that we really I'm focus on. I'm talking about culture. Oh, culture? I'm talking more about culture, not so much growth in terms of numbers, finance, sure. financial numbers. I'm talking about the culture. Do you think the culture, the entrepreneurial culture in Singapore, not so much talent, huh? the culture would have allowed you to grow, to scale at the pace at which you did, Mm -hmm. uh, if it was purely in Singapore and not simultaneously in San Francisco? Well, I think to a great extent, it's happening still. You know, a lot of the guys in Singapore are joining us. They come to our office uh, unannounced. <laughs> we, we have to lock the doors most of the time now. Uh, and, and it's because they're passionate about gaming. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, they turn up. You know, we, find, we found some really, really smart guys over here in, in Singapore who have joined our office and and um, have been designing stuff for us. It's, it's I think, even easier in the sense that um, there are lots of very passionate people in, in Singapore. Uh, the question is whether there are enough outlets to provide for that. Um, I think we are a great outlet for people who are passionate about gaming. So we it gravitate, we get a lot of people sending resumes and stuff like that to us. Um, the question is if there are enough outlets in other areas, like arts or, oh. or, or et cetera, for them to to chase those passions. Um, so I think Singapore, even till today, I mean, even today, is one of the growth drivers for, for us as a company. Okay. Questions, comments? Okay. Okay. Um, I actually get to know you when I was uh, watching a TV program in Shanghai because I, I actually base, I was based in Shanghai for a couple of years. Mines with Millionaire. I don't know whether you remember you, you did that show with, uh, on this program called ICS. Sure. So well, CCTV, right? Yeah, I think I ICS, yeah, International Channel Shanghai. Because I was I was living there for a couple of years, but I'm still based there. I mean, sure. like you, I, I come back every month as well. So my question to you is, um, in in China, I always heard people asking me about, you know, um, you guys Singaporeans are not there to take risks, and now these days I actually find that it's better to employ um, people from other country than Singaporeans. So in your opinion, you have been like based in California, you have been traveling all over the world, and you have an office in Shanghai as well. I remember, yes, I, yes. I remember the, the show interview one of your employees in Shanghai as well. I hope he said something nice about me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so my question to you is, um, how do you think Singaporeans can try to differentiate themselves now these days in this age, especially where globalization and we are losing... Actually, I mean, I live in Shanghai for a while, and I met people who speak English as fluent as Americans or as, as, as the British, you know? Sure, sure. So, how can we try to sustain this um, competitive advantage and how can we make ourselves stand out? Sure. Especially whether is it for people who are just going to graduate or just for people like me, you know, uh, who are like an alumni. Sure. Yeah. Great. Um, so th this is probably one of the subjects I'm, I'm personally quite passionate about. Um, and uh, it's one of the things I, I still espouse, I think, on, on, many, on many occasions that Singaporeans, you know, the term Singaporeans, we're a bit like global citizens of sorts. Mm. You know, we speak multiple languages. Mm. Um, we are fluent in, in many cultures. And, and I don't just say this from the, the government spiel kind of thing where, you know, we're good at everything and all that kind of stuff. We're not good at everything, you know, but there are certain things that we're really great at. And, and that's being able to balance uh, cultures in a multiple uh, situation and being really comfortable, I think, in, in various uh, locations. So, for example, I think it would be great if there was a lot of focus to fund companies by Singaporeans, even overseas, for that matter. It's one of those pet passions, I think, which 
would do really great. There's, there's um, no real reason for Singaporeans to be defined by mm -hmm. locale. That they, they have to be within Singapore to do something and things yep, like that. Yep. Um, because at the end of the day, and, and I'm being, I think you would share my, my views about that, Singaporeans like to come home. Mm -hmm. You know, they, uh, for some reason, you go overseas, Singaporeans like to hang out with other Singaporeans. You know, that's, that's one of those things, right? Um, Singaporeans like to find Cha Kui Tiao in some other location. When they can eat it every single damn day at home, you know, when they, when they travel and things like that, they like to come together and, and, and stick together. Now, the thing about, about this is, um, you know, I, I think fun, uh, Singaporeans tend to be global citizens. Uh, there are pros and cons. I wouldn't necessarily say, and I, and I know a lot of Singaporeans out there in Shanghai and, and the rest of the world, you know, uh, taking risks. But taking risks doesn't necessarily mean it's a great thing either. As I say, there's a role for every, every type of uh, person. Um, it really just depends on the, on the company or the, or the organization. I mean, if the organization does not value that kind of a mindset, maybe it's the wrong organization. You know, that's the... Uh, you don't have to go to that organization, you can find another one. Um, so net-net, the way I, you know, to sum it up, uh, I really see Singaporeans as a, uh, a class of really global citizens, and I think it's a resource that we have not truly appreciated. That, you know, we are afraid that the Singaporeans go overseas uh, and not come back. I think that's, a, that's actually a misnomer of sorts, because mm. most of the people I know, mm. you know, like James, like myself, like many of my friends, come back on a regular basis. I mean, I, I come back on a monthly basis. I fly back, uh, spend a few days here, and, and, and fly out. Um, and most of the guys because I know... Because you have family here. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's one of those things. Yeah, but you know, even the... the, the, the I think Singaporeans as a class of, of citizens have certain basic fundamentals um, associated, like language, ability, um, appreciation of culture, as I've mentioned, or different cultures. Mm -hmm. Um, other than that, it's all very innate. It's all very individual uh, mm, mm. after that. So it's hard for me to, to say, look, you know, even the, the Singaporeans in my office, some of them are nuts, all right? Uh, some of them are really, you know, uh, yeah. kind of followed by the book and, and things like that. It's, it's really, you know, outside our fundamentals, which, we have, uh, which is my point. We've got great fundamentals as Singaporeans. The rest of it is really up to the individual to to uh, compete or to uh, differentiate, so to speak. But our fundamentals alone are a clear differentiation. The fact that we are multilingual, the yep. fact that we are you know, multicultural in terms of uh, comfort level. Which allows us to adapt. Absolutely. OK. Next. Yes. Uh, my name? question. Name? Sorry? Your name? Uh, Agrim. 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 Okay. Yep. So uh, my question deals with Razor's philosophy in terms of targeting a particular kind of market. And I've noticed that Razer products tend to focus heavily on PC rather than, say, cross-platform or for other consoles. So, and it's not just for Razer, it's for other gaming companies as well, like SteelSeries or anyone, that they don't focus on other platforms. So what stops gaming companies from developing for these platforms? And the second part of this question is that there's another platform like your mobile gaming platforms that have been left out entirely. That there was this point when the PSP or your N-Gage mobile phones were the big rage that these will be the next gaming devices. And now, no one really talks about this anymore. So why is this the case, and does Razer plan to hit the mobile market anytime soon if there is an opportunity? Okay, cool. Um, well, I have to be very careful in answering, because the last couple of times I tweeted some stuff randomly, it became news. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I got a lot of haters on my, on my side. Maybe you're trying to trap me. Uh, or you're just a troll point planted here. <laughs> so, um, so the, the thing about us is that, and, and this, is, this is absolutely honest, uh, and I'm going to get in trouble anyway, so I don't care. Um, we, we, we don't really target markets per se, right? Um, how a product is, is actually invented in Razor typically starts from a bunch of guys sitting around, playing games, of course, and researching. Lies. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, then, and then some guy says, wouldn't it be cool if, if this was done? And then somebody would say, no, you're a moron. Nobody wants that. And it, it usually ends up in this whole big fist fight. All right? No, not a fist fight. It's happened before. But, you know, it, so people will argue and things like that. So, and then we design it. And then we'll go into prototyping phase and we try it out. We send it to our pro gamers to test and, 
and things like that. So I, I can't speak for other companies. Um, I can speak, for example, for Razer, where we design products that we use ourselves. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean I don't use the, any, any of the consoles. You know, I, I play on the PS3, I play on the Xbox, and, and things like that too. Uh, Halo, Last of Us, or w whatever, you know. Um, uh, yeah, I got in trouble because I, talk, I tweeted about Last of Us and it became like big news somewhere. But anyway, um, that's how we design products. We, we design products that we like and use ourselves. We don't do focus groups. We don't ask how big a market is and stuff like that. We tend to just launch it because we think it's cool and we think it's fun. Um, and so far, what we've realized is because we are the users ourselves, there are lots of gamers like you guys out there that appreciate the stuff that we do. So that's done really well. Now, um, the thing is because we are in a leadership position, Lots of these other companies kind of slipstream and, and follow the, the work that we do, which is great. I think we are trying to push forward, and we hope that more people do that. Mobile gaming, we have started doing things like uh, PC laptops, um, tablets, and things like that. We like mobile gaming. Uh, you know, one of my secret personal wishes is that you know, our gamers out there will be using our products during school. So I've got this school program, right? <laughs> that, that is really quite badass. We, we, try to, we try to encourage gamers who are in school to use our products because I think of all those times I was stuck in a lecture and I suddenly get, you know, I get really bored. I've got internet connection. I could be playing League of Legends. I could be playing Dota or whatever it is, right? And, and there I am stuck in a way where it would be really rude for me to get out of the lecture. Can we censor this part? So, no? <laughs> no, but, but, you know, that's part, of, that's part of one of the things I've always wanted to be able to do. Uh, multitask. Everybody's been able to multi. I mean, I've, I'm not going to be offended if somebody's playing some game out there, like that dude. But <laughs> you know, uh, but it's fine. You know, that's that's one of the things that we do. So mobile gaming definitely something we're interested in. Um, you know, as to what products that we're going to come up with, we, we are not talking about it right now. Yeah. Okay. That that uh, before we come to you, just one moment. There are plenty of questions coming online. Uh, this one, 31 people have asked this question. Is it? But 31, about, yeah. So we're going to put, show it up there. Oops. What do you, uh, what do you I, look I, for? I support the alliance, by the way. What do you look for in an individual when you hire? What do I look for? In How many of you would like to be hired by him? Oh, trust me. You should ask the guys in the company. You may not want to. <laughs> OK, afterwards, uh, uh, you all queue up. OK, okay. Right. now listen very carefully. You must answer uh, the question properly, yeah? Sure. Oh, okay. Truthfully, truthfully. Okay. Clearly, he thinks I don't answer my questions properly. Yeah, so far, <laughs> some of the questions are a bit PAP ish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'm, I've got this diabolical plan to take maybe, over the country. Maybe, yeah. yeah can maybe you imagine? We, uh, you are, you're gaming the system, so to speak. Yeah, maybe right? I'm gaming the system. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. right. So if I ever run, please vote for me. I'll probably do it as an independent, though. So, you know. Um, let me think. Uh, what do I look for? I, I think. Outside of the you know, traditional skill sets, for example, that are suited for the role, so for example, engineering, you know, the technical skills, or a lawyer, or a, or, a, or a marketing person, outside of that, I think the key thing is really passion. You know, it's, it's, um, it's a very amorphous term, yeah. but, but... And somewhat cliched. Well, I, I wouldn't say it's cliched in the uh, sense that... If you could illustrate it. Yeah. So I've asked for all kinds of really difficult things from people who join the company. Like, for example, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I say, okay, great, now's a great time. I've just finished playing my game. We can meet up and, and talk about it, right, uh, if you want to join the company. And usually because I'm jet lagged, I don't really care, right? <laughs> um, it's, it's small things like that, right? Of course, I'm not going to be difficult to the person, but, but passion really si shines through. Yeah. And, and particularly for our kind of business, um, where we don't necessarily run it like a, like a business, it becomes inherently a lot more important that it's, it's and I, I use this anecdote. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, I met with a competitor company that, was want, that wanted to acquire us. And, uh, and uh, in the conversations with that competitor company, they said, look, you know, we can buy you out now or we will crush you, very simply, wow. right? And I said, okay, you know, kind of scary, but that's fine. And uh, they got the, 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 the head of their, their department to come speak with us, uh, to, to come speak with me. And uh, after the conversations and stuff like that, I asked him, and I said, look, you know, are you a gamer yourself, right? And he says, nah, I wouldn't let my son play. It's, uh, you know, it's such a waste of time. 
And instantly, at that, yeah. in that two seconds, I went back to my guys and I said, look, you know, these guys will never be a threat yeah. because they're not passionate about what they do. Mm. You know, um, even if they're much larger than us today, it doesn't really matter because we are going to kick their ass anyway, right, ultimately. And uh, today we are kicking their ass, which is great. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah. that's, that's okay. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that every single person in the company is a huge gamer and razor, no. But every single person, I dare say, has a huge appreciation for gaming. It's not one of those things that they're going to tell the guys, no, it's a horrible activity and things like that. And that's why it's so important for us to evangelize gaming over and over yep. again. Yep. Because it's something that we are passionate about. Great. And kick-ass is good. Of course. And, and, uh, and you know, if you obviously focus a lot on enjoying it, having fun doing it. And I don't think it's just words. I, I get the sense that you, you know, the, the interesting thing here is, you know, some time back, uh, we, I, I had, um, I remember a politician in Singapore said, you know, we, um, we, we are very, very serious about fun. And uh, about fun. we are very, very serious about fun. And, and uh, we, also, we also believe so much in spontaneity that we plan for it. You know, <laughs> uh, you know we form a committee sure. to... to <laughs> To study spontaneity, you know, and right. um, so, but but fun. Sure. Very quickly, can you can you tell us what fun means to you? Why is fun such an important component uh, to your success, to the company's success? Well, well, given that when we first started out, gaming wasn't a business, right? It was uh, one of those things where it was um, uh, not highly regarded as a career per se we had to develop a pretty thick skin before we entered into gaming. And even till today, you know, I meet people where they go, what, you're doing computer games and you know, gaming and stuff like that. So um, fun became one of those things where you know, internally, externally, it became really important for us. You know, it was the gaming sessions in the office that we still do have. Um, it was part of the, it was a great excuse if we screwed up. Oh, we we're just doing it for fun, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, but we are still doing it for fun. And, and it's also one of those things that keeps us sane that, uh, you know, when bankers and stuff like that sit in front of me and say, oh, you need to, to get this amount of bottom line and, and, and whatever, we go like, you know, dude, you know, we, it's, it's fun for us. You know, don't, don't spoil it for us. And, and that's one thing that we, we hold very dear to ourselves because if we don't get to design crazy stuff, we just become another corporate suit. Yeah. No offense to the suit, but... It's, uh, it, this is it's, not corporate. Yeah, and it's not corporate, so it's <laughs> fine. But, but so it's one of those things that continues to drive us. And honestly speaking, you know, like for example, laptops. When we entered the laptop business, I did it because I couldn't find a laptop for myself that I liked. And it was crazy. Everything was big and thick and heavy, or it was super thin and it didn't have the kind of power that we wanted. So we went into it. Made absolutely no business sense whatsoever. We, we spent millions of dollars getting the right talent, investing in the right tools and stuff like that. Even to today, we are kind of losing money in every single unit that we sell, which is insanely expensive. But given that we are a boutique shop, it, it did become a product that we are proud of and we liked mm. um, at the end of the day. And came, things came to a head. We sat down and said, look, you know, if we make a mistake here, it's going to take down the company. Yeah. It's going to be tough. Still of the night, like a meeting like that, well, with less people. And then... The point of which really tipped it was that, hey, it's just for fun. So life is short. <laughs> Let's just do it. And it's crazy, but hey. So we, we went ahead. We launched the product. I mean, we went through a couple of iterations. We're super insanely proud of the product. But hey, you know, we realized that there were other like-minded people who, who really appreciate it. So fun is really one of those things that helps us make decisions, which is really fun. I mean, uh, it's, it's great. I mean, we make decisions that that they're horrible, but we justify it by calling it fun. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it's, it's, and it's then, much better. And that's why, that's why, Min Liang, <laughs> you should not list. Oh, because well. the fun is going to be taken out, taken out of the equation. Oh, we'll see, we'll it's see. It's going to be damn hard. <laughs> um, okay, yes, question. My name is Tan Si Ping, alumnus of University of Malaya at that time. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. you mentioned that it's okay to get an F, <laughs> right? And I presume you can tumble along alive and get a lot of failure. But there's one caveat, provided you learn from the failure. If you get forward and all that, and you never learn anything and just get up and 
go ahead. Sure. Then I think it's a waste of time, right? So you should learn more from your failure. And the more failure you have, the better for you. Sure. If you I learn from that. it. Right. So right? you're talking about lifelong learning. Lah. Yes. Yeah. So you no, got to. See, in Singapore, profit, we have to yeah. tag these lines, you know? Yeah. You know, profit. lifelong learning. Yeah. Okay. So I, then, I agree with that. I, then, I think it's okay. about Then the other one, you say you hate all the metrics and all that. Right? Metrics. Yeah, the yeah. metrics and so on and so on. But the trouble is, you need a thing that you must measure a thing. If you don't measure a thing, how do you know are you doing better or, or, or worse than before? Therefore, sure. you ought to have a standard so that you know we have done. 80%. Maybe next time we, we butter it and do it 90%. So if you don't have a measure, how are you going to improve? Sure. Therefore, it's anything at all that you need to measure, that right. mine is five, you're six, okay, you're better than me. But if you don't have a measure, how do you know I'm better than you or you are better than me? Therefore, although you hate all these metrics, but you still have to stick to some standard. Sure. That there's a certain standard and then you can compare. Otherwise, you go nowhere. Right. Can you comment? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> this is, that's why I love him, you know. He's been here for three years, every month, right? Without fail. Reality check. <laughs> that hair is not dyed, uh, it's real. <laughs> okay? It's well, called <laughs> wisdom. Okay. Well, I, I, well, you know, the problem is I would di respectfully disagree. Uh, <laughs> You naughty boy. I know, I'm horrible, right? I, it's, it's terrible. Yeah, yeah, no I know, respect. I know. No, I also uh, have a bit of grey hair, okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so I, 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 I would say, you know, learning from mistakes is absolutely important. I, I think that's one of those things which uh, I totally agree with. Um, the thing about metrics, I think, on the other hand, is um, it's hard to argue metrics when I have no perception of what metrics there are to, to, to do. It's like, it's like designing a product. Somebody tells me, look, you know, Min, and there are lots of products for, for all you Razer fans out there. I mean, that you would say that, look, you know, we could make a huge ton of money, for example, and as a metric, if money was a metric for us, if we just made some slight changes here and there. But I don't have a concept of the metric. So it's like, you know, when you ask me about net worth and, and things like that, I, I don't really care about it because at the end of the day, what we are, we are passionate about is designing products that we, we love ourselves. Um, I'm not obsessed with how much money we make. In fact, if tomorrow we had to start all over again, big deal, you know, shoot me. It's, it's one of those things. So um, I think constantly in terms of designing products sometimes also, the metrics are the ones that, that, that get to me. And in, in the company, people have kind of learned to not to tell me, hey, you know, based off this, we could do so much better, or, or why don't you try to make a, a cheaper product so that more people can, can enjoy it and stuff like that. It's, I suppose if there was a metric for, for product greatness, absolutely. We would, we would love to do well in that. It's just that maybe my point is traditional metrics that many of us are, are measured by, an A to a F, or, or uh, you want to make a lot of money as an investment banker or, or go and be a management consultant. Those are metrics that, at least for me, it isn't something that, that makes me passionate. I mean, if I want to make a lot of money, I might have stayed in law, right? Um, but I, hey, I'm having a lot more fun. If fun had a metric, that would be great. Um, but so that's us. So it's appreciation of the metrics. Maybe it's not that I don't like metrics per se, but it's that the traditional metrics don't necessarily apply. I guess, in a way, I mean, you're differentiating metrics from measurement. Uh, you can measure something that's intangible without actually applying metrics. Uh, you, you know what I'm saying? I, that's, a, that's a sense I get. I mean, you, you can't put a metrics to fun, but you can measure it in some way from, from your how from proxy indicators, sure. right? How you feel. Right. This is a well, question that uh, <laughs> Professor Victor Savage has as well. Yes, Victor? Yes. What is the difference between the entrepreneurship culture here as compared to USA? Is there a difference? First place. Uh, yeah, there is a difference. I, I think there is a difference. And it's a... You know, it's, it's fundamental, culturally and things like that. One of the, one of the points I, I, I like to talk about is, for example, you know, if I'm in uh, San Francisco and I'm grabbing my breakfast in a, or in a Starbucks or something like that, usually, and this happens on a daily basis, right? There's a guy behind me or some, some, 
someone's talking about, look, I've got this business idea, or I'm going to meet this venture capitalist, or I'm going to do this, or something like that. At breakfast, I'll have somebody at the side. Everyone's got an idea. Everyone's trying to do something. All right? That's the entrepreneurship culture in, in the Valley. Right? Everyone is go-getting. They want to do something and stuff like that. In, in Singapore, it's a little different. It's, um, it's uh, more of, uh, let's look at all the fundamentals. Let's look at what we can do to, to make sure that there's a good safety net or, or so on and so forth. Now, I wouldn't necessarily say it's, well, I would say that it's different. I wouldn't necessarily say that one is superior than the other, right? Because um, there are some great entrepreneurs that have come out in Singapore, right? Like, like? Uh, well, lots of guys, you know, everyone from uh, OSIM, Creative, and, and um, High Flux. Uh, High Flux, Olivia is, is, is insanely intelligent. So there are lots and lots of entrepreneurs that come out. I don't necessarily think it's important for us to have a similar culture of sorts. Mm -hmm. You know, there isn't a necessity for us to say, look, it has to be that I need to go down to Sand Hill Circle Road to pitch a, a VC every other day. I think a true entrepreneur, whether he's in Indonesia, which I've met some great entrepreneurs in Indonesia, for example, um, Singapore, Japan, Taiwan, uh, you know, Europe, etc., will find our way. Is there something in Singapore, our culture, that you think we can have a little bit more of that'll help? I think if we had more people, that would help. In not, general, not necessarily. I, I, I think as a as a as a group, uh, you know, we've got a couple of million people. In you Singapore. talk about the larger pool. It's a larger pool. I, I think that I mean I've met some really smart people in Singapore, and I continually meet them all the time. Uh, I think trying to put a, a certain kind of uh, uh, framework to say it must be like the valley, or no, no, it, or, it's or not about it right. must be like the valley. But is there some quality that you personally think we could have a little bit more of? It's not a criticism of Singapore, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I'm trying to get you off the fence. Sure. Uh, <laughs> maybe because I, I, I constantly see we have got so many roles in the company that, mm. but if you're talking about specifically entrepreneurship. 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 Okay. Yeah. Is there a particular quality? Uh, I think less reliance on the government, maybe? You know, that's, uh, that's one of the things I, I hear often. I mean, when I think government support for entrepreneurs is a horrible idea. You know, it's, it's terrible. I mean, the number of, of people that have come to speak to me about uh, investing in their companies usually ends off with, hey, look, you know, if you invest X dollars, I can get a matching amount from the government and, and things like that. That's, um, I think that sets a, a, a wrong tone. Why? Right from the get-go. Because... Uh, I think all, you know, uh, ideas or investments should be based off an idea or a passion or, or a dream, etc. It shouldn't be predicated upon, you know, I can get help from the government and things like that. Now, now don't get me wrong. It's not because I didn't get any help from the government and things like that. And, and I didn't. But I'm, I think it's a good thing. And I still want to come back and, and do whatever I can because, you know, I've seen also bitter guys that have sat back and said, oh, I, you know, government didn't help me, it sucks, and, and they come back and stuff like that. I don't think that that's, that's helpful either, mm. right? Mm. Um, I think we've come, we come from a great you structure. You think it's, it's, it's developed a, a crutch mentality uh, of sorts? Somewhat. Mm. Uh, you know, I think it's, um, it's good in certain aspects. I think giving them an, incuba uh, an incubation or mm. place for people mm. to meet mm. um, is incredible. You know, giving connections and stuff like that, absolutely fine, right? Um, but I think in general, outside, anything over and above in, should be left cash to... cash handouts. That should be left to market forces, okay. right? Because but you didn't get any. I mean, you, in your initial, you know, investment phase, you, you didn't get investors. Uh, well, we, we had angel investors. We yeah. found our way. Yeah. We found our way. Found, right. and, and you're saying that you, will, you were forced to find your way, and because you were dogged, you managed to get them, right? Mm. Yeah, you know, just, just as I would share, you know, it's like playing a computer game, right? You, you reach an obstacle, it's not necessarily a setback. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you try to find ways and means to get around it. I mean, I've been obsessed over a certain level over and over again. Um, until such a point of time, you find a cheat code or something like that to, to get past it. Um, but, but that's the nature of, of uh, I think, entrepreneurs in, 
as a whole. I mean, if you hit a, a, a brick wall, you just try to vault over it, you try to find a bazooka yeah. to blast through it or something like that. You yeah. know, I, I must share with you something disgusting about this guy. Oh, uh, there are the many disgusting many, things many, about me. One of the many. Uh, he, he, I asked him what were some of the setbacks you had, what, what were some of the frustrations. He gave me this, this blank, duh kind of look at me. You know, like, what, what do you mean? You know, and, and, and the disgusting thing is I think he meant it. You know, that, that um, he really didn't face any challenges in the conventional sense of the word. You know, that I deal with a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, and in the nature of my work. I deal, and and I, t I can tell you the, the constant thing I hear is the government doesn't do this, the people suck, this is a problem, that's a problem. But he, he just defined it very differently. He's, he defined it as, in gaming words, it's a challenge, it's a hurdle, I just need to find a way around it. In fact, it is exciting, you know. Uh, it's, it's hard to get, get our minds around that way of looking at things. Now, mm -hmm. did you have it while you were in Singapore? Or, and if so, are you an anomaly? I think most of the guys here would probably share the same uh, mindset. I mean, unfortunately, I'm much older. But uh, I'm, I'm old. You mean it's, it's a gaming attitude? Uh, it's a pretty much a gaming attitude, I think, to a great extent. You know, you, you meet a setback. I mean, of course, from time to time when you get on a, on a, on a server, you get a bunch of guys, you know, when you play. <laughs> you know, it's... I'm going to ask you. No, the, the noobs are always on your side, right? The other side is, like, always the best, right? So, so what, how do you deal with it, right? You, you drop off the server, of yes. course. <laughs> so, no, but... But uh, that's, that's the thing. I, I think everything is, uh, yeah, it's funny, right? Uh, it, I'm the guy who rages, like, oh, you guys. But, but uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's we, we treat the whole thing literally like, like a game. Um, even a team, you, you, you bring together it, uh, as a game. You know, some people are good in the carry or whatever it is. You, you just, you know, somebody needs to organize a raid or, or whatever. And, and it's, um, it's absolutely the same thing. I mean. I don't necessarily perceive it as a, as a setback or challenge. His, uh, now that I look back, um, don't get me wrong. I, when something goes wrong, we go like, Holy what are we going to do, right? With uh, that smile. With, <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, you started it. Uh, but but uh, because it's just part and parcel of, a, of if, you, if you treat it as a game, it's not so bad. And, and it's difficult. I mean, it's difficult to phase us when, you know, you get a bunch of guys that, have different uh, intentions altogether. I mean, the, you know, I've, had, I've met up with, as I've mentioned, other corporate companies that go like, how do you guys run your company? And we go like, pretty, pretty badly. You know, <laughs> usually we go like, we rock, you know, at the end of the day, so that, that's fine. You know, that's no, but it's, it's, it, I think th this is a very important point, you know, I, and, and obviously this is a biased sample. A lot of you are, how many of you are active gamers? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, Will older people, not older, older sure. people, <laughs> will older people ever be able to sort of get into the groove with you? Sure, I mean, Notice I work the language with, I'm adapting. Eh? I work with some really, really smart people. Um, oh, you're saying we're not smart? <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, so we work, I mean, at, at, at Razor, you know, we've, uh, the age ranges everything from uh, teens. We've got, uh, yeah, we've got child labor in the office, um, <laughs> teens to, uh, in the 70s, right? Um, it's, it's uh, to us, it's a mindset change uh, to appreciate the way which we do things. Um, we have a bit of a perspective of life that isn't shared by many of the traditional guys, but hey, we, we don't ask, we don't demand that our uh, perspectives are, are forced on others. And then we hope nobody forces their perspectives on us. I think that's one of those things mm -hmm. uh, which we will very respectfully decline to agree. Uh, but yeah, we, we, we have people in all age ranges. In fact, one of the people I, I respect immensely is my COO. Uh, he's, in, he's in his 60s and he's a force of nature. He's a really smart guy and uh, he's a huge, he appreciates gaming in a huge way. Okay, this is a very important question from cyberspace. Sure. How many black t-shirts do I have? Ah, okay, this is a difficult one. 
So I have a lot. And I'm going to hunt down the troll who, who posted that up. <laughs> oh, you're the guy. OK, that's fine. I'm going to revoke your game. Who's the guy? Who's the guy? The <laughs> troll are you? Okay. So I have, I, have, I, have quite a, I have quite a number, yeah. OK, there's one more, one sure. more, one more, one more. What's the secret <laughs> to perfect hair? So, well, I mean, many, many have asked me this Yeah, before. who, who, who? Anyone from here? Uh, uh, you see, this is, the, this is the problem of leaving gamers in this thing. And I could have been respectable one day. <laughs> you know, um, a I was going to ask you, you actually paid for this? I'm sorry? I was going to ask him, you actually paid to get this done? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> Uh, well, a lot of care and attention, the same kind of uh, attention I give to designing product. <laughs> All right? Perfection. All right. Okay, the uh, final question. Any burning question here? Uh, yes, go. Good evening. My name is Iwi. I'm a year four bioengineering student from NUS. You mentioned about three values in your introduction. It's okay to waste time. It's okay to get an F. It's okay not to work so hard. And um, these are three complete opposite from Asian values. Values that Asian hold strongly to working hard, scoring the best grades, being efficient. So in fact, it's not only Asians. Westerners respect this trait as well. Uh, in fact, like some Westerners even feel that it's <laughs> because of the three values you mentioned, that the Western world is lagging behind now and the Asian world is uh, charging forward. How do you make the three values that you talk about, wasting time, getting F, and not working hard, how you make these values work for you? So this is my first question. The second question, I only have two questions. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting intimidated here. Gaming addiction. Um, People link it, tend to link it to social problem. How can gaming be a benefit to society? Thank oh, you. Very team, are you? <laughs> Looking at your hairstyle, I wouldn't imagine. It. <laughs> <laughs> oh, your deception, huh? deception. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe first up, I don't really care what people <laughs> think about my, my, my three values. You're going to say about my hair. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, I, I suppose, I, I, maybe, you know, it's like, it's like we, we started off the company by not caring about how people perceived our values. Even internally within the company, we still don't care about a lot of traditional norms. We try not, we, we, we intentionally try to ignore certain norms because we just don't like people to tell us what to do in general, right? So, so whether it's uh, traditional Asian values or, or Western, you know, perspectives of, of uh, the way which we do things at, at, at Razor, um, or you know, uh, I can get bankers in a sharp suit telling me, look, you know, Min, you could be worth so much more if you didn't run the company in such a crazy way that you do it. Um, yeah, but it wouldn't be fun. So you know. So anyway, <laughs> that's the that, that's the that's the that's one. The other. Say sorry publicly. I'm sorry. sorry. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Uh, the second thing, let me think, what was it? What, oh, uh, what was the second question again? Addiction. Oh, no. gaming addiction. Uh, yeah, it's a horrible, horrible thing. <laughs> okay, I insist that we all observe a 10 second silence <laughs> to recognize it's a horrible, horrible it's a, thing, gaming. It's a, it's a horrible, horrible thing. Yeah. So I think all the noobs should get off the servers yeah. and, <laughs> and uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, gaming addiction. You know, it's one of those things where, you know, back in the day, you watch TV, it's too much TV, right? Uh, it's, a sign of the, it's a sign of the times. Rock and roll, you know, I'm sure some of you might appreciate it. Horrible influence on society. It's going uh, to, to destroy things. Miley Cyrus, oh, good God, <laughs> all right? <laughs> so, so that's the thing. Addiction, I think it's part and parcel of life. You know, everything in moderation, I suspect. Even better when you're playing games and it's part of your job. I'm still trying to figure it out, I guess. How do you make these values work for you? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know. We're still trying to figure it out. You, you know, I wish ask the question sitting cross-legged then. <laughs> yeah. Can answer no? Yeah, no, that's my point. I, 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 I think we're still trying to make it work for us. I mean, we are a bit of a random company, you know. 
it's uh, we we are run by sheer luck. You know that's uh, that's something I, I I say all the time. Right. Okay. Great. Who else? Oh, one of our uh, youngest. <laughs> Hi, my name is Yeo King Jun, alumni. Louder, um, louder. Can't hear. I. You have to help me out here because I've been sitting there trying to figure out what's this guy, you know, he, he has these three values which our f other questioner asked, you know, you have no, don't care about wasting time, don't care about getting F, don't, you know, I wanted to ask you because from what I've heard throughout this session, the first thing that struck me is this guy, either he comes from a family with very deep pockets <laughs> or very high intellect. So you didn't share with us uh, your family background. Oh, Maybe sure. you, know, you want to go into that because I think you're a very unusual guy who cannot be from our Singapore educational system. You know? <laughs> <laughs> my, my second Are question... Are you suggesting he has a genetic flaw? I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to find out. So maybe you want to share something. With <laughs> sure. My second question is because you have a law degree, I'm not sure what values you bring to the table as an entrepreneur? What, what is it that, through your education in, in the law school, maybe it's not, uh, that helps you to build up such a successful bus business, given that you, know, you didn't know anything about business? Yeah, and, sure. and, if, and the, the, quite a few people ask this question online as well, about a related question. How did you manage the transition from lawyer, practicing lawyer, sure. to entrepreneur? Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So very quickly, family, you know, um, middle class, I think we're pretty normal. Uh, I didn't have to worry about anything, so that's great. I think my, my parents uh, took good care of us, so I think that was uh, uh, one of the best things. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare say that I didn't rely on them at all, because I think the very fact that I didn't have to worry about yes. them is a great benefit already. So I think, you know, I have to really thank my parents that they are really independent from, from that perspective. Um, Clearly, they were a bit maverick also, you know, it's this stop at two thing, you know, they had four kids, so I'm the youngest of four. Um, my mom was uh, really clear right from the get-go that you can either be a doctor or a lawyer, right, uh, to the four kids and uh, ended up with two doctors, two lawyers, right? <laughs> so she, she really kind of really focused on, on telling us what to do. That was great, but then, of course, I managed to slipstream my way out of uh, being a lawyer, so that was great. Um, so I think net-net, you know, a lot... I, I owe to my parents in terms of, of guiding and, and uh, maybe a bit of the Maverick Street coming from them too. So that's one. The uh, thing about transition across to, from a lawyer to, to uh, a startup, so to speak, is, um, as I've mentioned, it's, it's just different ways of getting to the same objective um, at the end of the day. So Many people have said it's, it's very different. I don't, I don't think it's, it's very different too. When you, when you look at a contract, a single word can make a huge difference to the entire contract. Yeah. Likewise, when you do a design, the smallest bits of, of a design can make a huge difference to the entire, entire product. So I think attention to detail was something I, I took from being a lawyer. Management as a lawyer is also very different. Uh, what I tend to do is I get two people. They will, they, I mean, uh, every time there's a decision that needs to be done, I'll have two people give their, their views and stuff like that or uh, have them argue the hell out of it and then I'll just say, okay, this is the decision, let's move ahead, all right? Um, and of course, I'm the highest court, so that's good. Uh, <laughs> but but that's, that's one of the things which is a little different. I don't have a preconceived idea of any solution. So many of the questions that you guys may ask me, I'm kind of approaching it as a lawyer where I'll take a step back and I, I tend to be on the fence all the time, but that's literally how we run things at Razor. We try to get all the information. We make a decision. Now, it may be a wrong decision, but we have a saying at the company that it's better a wrong decision than no decision, yeah. right, ultimately. And then, of course, if you reverse it, so be it. Yeah. A, a quick um, follow-up question. What are the advantages that you, you, you benefited from not being an engineer in, in this firm, which is essentially engineering-driven? Well, um, I think to a certain extent, uh, I get to ask really stupid questions, right? Um, that engineers would kind of sneer at, but uh, as an as a addendum to that, uh, because it's sometimes so basic or so out of, the, out of whack, the engineer will be able to think, oh yeah, well, I, I didn't think of that, for example. So I think that's a, it's a bit of an uh, advantage because it's approaching you know, 
problems or questions from a totally different perspective. And, from, uh, the from the consumer user perspective? Uh, from, a, from outsider's Outside. perspective, mm, okay. right? Like, uh, have you thought of doing the hinge like that? Or have you considered putting a heat pipe on the other edge and things like that? Some, I mean, nine times out of 10, the engineer rolls his eyes and thinks I'm a moron, you know, privately. But it's the one time, for example, the guy goes, okay, I didn't think of that. I'm gonna go back and, and try it out. And that, that's helpful. Great. At least that's what I'm told. Maybe the engineers <laughs> want to make me feel better, right? Who knows? Okay, last question. Okay, so... Just one of those guys on the internet, then, <laughs> you know. Trolls, are. <laughs> okay, uh, my name's Parag. So from the, from the point of view of someone who's interested in game design and development to chief gamer of Razer, um, what, what kind of things do you want to see in gaming in the next like 10, 15 years, how do you see gaming evolving? And like, if you're not like looking at it from a business perspective, as a pure gamer, what do you want to see in games? And also, I, I asked a question, I'm not sure it will see the light of day, but what's the worst you've been pawned at a game? Oh. Which game? <laughs> right. Uh, well, first up, uh, what would I like to see in, in gaming? I would say, I, I think it's gonna get a lot more immersive and I, I love that. Um, you know, um, everything from Oculus to, you know, um, VR, etc. I think it's, it's going to be great that it gets a lot more immersive. I don't want to get more physical, to be very <laughs> candid with you. Um, I see certain things of, of movements and stuff like that. I, I'm not a big fan of that. Mm. Um, I like to kind of sit and, and play my computer game. Maybe it's it might change, knows, right? Uh, but it's more immersive. I think it's going to get more pervasive. So, for example, uh, it's going to start calling me on my phone for a, for a mission or or it's gonna be location-based where you know, I can get location-based missions and things like that. I think that's great. Um, so I think on that front, it's uh, uh, a lot of work is being done. I think on, on that level, on a, on a virtual reality, on an augmented reality and, and wearables perspective, biofeedback, et cetera. So, so uh, on the worst I've been owned in a game, let me think, uh, <laughs> happens pretty often. So <laughs> uh, not that often. Um, I don't know. I mean, we have our good days and we have our bad days. You know, it all, it all happens. Uh, uh, so far, I've got a better streak than, uh, you know, I'm, I can to admit, at least, at this point of time. What, so, so far, so good. Was that an offer to take him on? Might be. I'll play Quake with you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Great question. Okay, final one. One question from, from here. Okay? From online. Where is it? Wait, 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 wait. Is you that see? a Razer product giveaway? <laughs> so, yes, are there Razer product giveaways? I'm sorry, I didn't come with anything. So that's a, what, 37 freaking votes? My God. <laughs> so is this why you guys came? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Just too freaking bad. <laughs> the more? Uh, who do I to support? Uh, Alliance, of course. You know, we sponsored the Alliance. We founded them. You know, it was great. Um, and they won $1.43 million. Yeah, that's what people play. They play computer games, they win $1.43 million in a game. That's great. Okay, this. What a valuable takeaway from Man US. Uh, if you have nothing, say so. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> what is my most valuable takeaway from Man US? Wow, stress. Wow. <laughs> uh, wow. I'm trying to figure it out. No, no, don't get me wrong. I mean, there are lots of stuff, you know, that you learn in, 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 in university. It's, it's, it's a whole slew of stuff. And I'm not being on the fence over here. Um, everything looks nicer in retrospect. Yeah. I mean, I'll be candid. I skipped most of my lessons in NUS. Uh, no, you skipped, therefore you weren't in the class, but you were somewhere around. Yeah, I mean, uh, no, no, I was not in the school sometimes. Um, I had a great girlfriend back then who did lots of great notes. Um, <laughs> uh, Euphemism. Uh, let me think. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I think lots of takeaways would be, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, well, at least law school. <laughs> Should we take a nap? So, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I learned a lot. I think, I think the friends that I've made in, he sounds in law as school. If he's trying to persuade, <laughs> convince himself. I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot. <laughs> sounds like a Sanskrit mantra. Uh. <laughs> No, it's great. I mean, I think the friends I've made in law school, you know, I still keep in, in, in great contact with them, you know, all the time. Uh, the contacts uh, I've made, so to speak, um, you know, I, I still meet them on a regular basis. I think, I think that is pretty much, uh, you know, the most important thing. I mean, it's been 11 years since I've been back here. 
wearing a convocation gown, which I rented, and that's a ripoff. Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, man, that, that's got to be a good business to, to have. Uh, the, yeah, it's, it's really the friendships and stuff like that. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be honest to say that I don't really remember anything I, I learned, you know, over here. But, you know, the, the certain things follow. Uh, and, and really, at the end of the day, it's the, the contacts that you make, the friends that you make, and, and that's the relationships that, that kind of follow through, whether it's here in Singapore, or I still meet some of them overseas in San Francisco, or in Shanghai, and, and things like that. So that's the, probably the greatest takeaway I've, I've got from uh, NUS. That's good enough. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Terrific session. I'm sure there's a lot more that Min would like to share with you outside. Just prevent him from having his meal, <laughs> right? Um, we've got something for you, Min. Oh, great. That's oh. a great picture of uh, you with a very handsome guy. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, it was taken just now, <laughs> okay? I was trying, I was trying to look for the handsome guy, actually. Yeah, I, I'm so. looking for him too. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Min. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, yeah. thank you. And um, now we've got, we've got something for you to do. Oh. Um, you need to write something here. Actually, I, I'm, I'm pretty good looking. You are, uh, you are. You no, should no, write no, something, something nice about me and, and the show and so on here. Sure. Yeah. All uh, right. Then, okay. And then you've got to read it out. Oh, that's a lot of pressure, you know. <laughs> uh, let me think. Okay, try and make sure it's grammatically correct. Oh, come on. You know, <laughs> you know Americans can't spell. You know, the other interesting thing I noticed about Min is uh, he doesn't have an American accent. And isn't it interesting? We've got people who haven't left Singapore who have an American accent. <laughs> All right, so yeah. I've written, waste time, don't work hard, get Fs. <laughs> All right, All right. man. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and, you. And, and, and I'm sure all of you agree that, um, that, you know, this is the kind of product that we would love to showcase. Hey, give me a hand. Oh, sure, 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 sure. Last photo. <laughs> Too much. You don't want to put a hand in the pocket. We'd love to showcase as our product, take credit. For, and, and seriously, my age, you're the kind of guy I want to adopt as a son. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm speechless now. Right. Because you're rich. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much.